Okay, good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you're calling from. Um, my name is Devin Green, and I'm going to be your host for What to Expect from Therapy, You Are the Expert. Um, I may be a bit biased in this, but I'm an extreme advocate for mental health treatment. I feel that it is completely necessary um, just for navigating yourself as a human being. Um, and since the pandemic, a lot of numbers have risen for therapy enrollment, which is great, but I really hope it's just not a spike. I hope that it's a trend that kind of remains consistent and has shown the world um, how important and effective treatment is for you. And, you know, whether it's behavioral changes or psychological things that you're wanting to modify, it's always a good idea to get support no matter which form that it's coming in. You know, sometimes families and friends aren't enough. You need that um, extra layer up, up through the form of a therapist. So really excited to be doing a training on the topic that I'm so on fire about. Um, so just a little on me. My name is Seven Green. I am a sex and relationship therapist and also a proud partner of Pineapple Support, where I offer subsidized therapy treatment to um, adult workers in the industry. Um, so I have a little different lens on it, but it doesn't differ from anyone else within the field. Um, I actually wanted to open up with my own therapeutic journey. Um, I actually didn't start getting into therapy until I was a therapist. Um, just for one, to get support for myself in the field that's very, you know, high paced and demanding, and to also just learn from other therapists out there and their different approaches. Um, but my experience started way maybe two to three years ago. So it wasn't as normalized. There weren't all these platforms where you could find therapists and kind of pick your preference and filter out, you know, availability and insurance. You know, pretty much psychology today was the only directory for finding someone. And for me, I only found in my area in downtown Los Angeles, a white, cis, heterosexual, older male. Um, so already with that, I went into my session very nervous, very anxious, um, completely unprepared. You know, I thought I could just show up, tell him my problems, and he would take it from there. Um, so very passive in my expectations. Um, so naturally, um, it wasn't a good fit. I didn't feel comfortable with him. I wasn't able to share a lot of aspects of myself that I felt that he wouldn't understand. Um, to be fair, I think he did try his best to give me interventions and everything, but it just simply wasn't a connection. And that unfortunately discouraged my continuing my treatment and seeking other therapists in general. Like I was just kind of pretty much over it. And that is actually the story I hear for a lot of people to come to me in therapy. They, they in our first session, they're honest and saying, you know, I tried this before, it didn't work out. It's been years before I tried again, but I am here. So hopefully just with this, you can avoid that type of experience and discouragement and be equipped with what you need to know to be an expert in your own treatment because that is the way it's supposed to be. Okay, so in order to be the expert of your own therapy, you first have to kind of understand the misconceptions out there. And there are many of them, unfortunately, still to this day with therapy, even though we've come a long way um, from a lot of traditional views on <laughs> what therapy and getting, getting treatment is, um, there's still, you know, some common myths and misconceptions out there. So I want to start with the top four that I probably still hear to this day on a consistent basis and do my best to just provide further education on it. Um, the first one is that people who seek psychotherapy are weak, mentally ill, are crazy. This unfortunately is still very much a truth for a lot of people who are unaware of what therapy is. Um, I got my training and education and built my clientele, luckily in California and more, um, you know, mental health, well-being, positive places. Um, but then actually moved back to Texas where <clears throat> I found out that they're still very much in the old patterns and narratives of therapy being for crazy people are 
um, we just pray about that or we don't talk about that or we don't, you know, why are they having to see someone when there's family? They're still very family and keeping things in the community. But this, this is very problematic because, you know, it keeps people from getting help and, and fears of being seen as these negative things. And also it couldn't be further from the truth. Um, I have a mixed bag of clients, ones who, you know, come to me, you know, stable and pretty much just wanting to maintain their stability and keep their um, problems or issues or barriers at a minimum. And there's people who come with a whole bag and handful of things that they like to address from communication skills to relationships to anxiety to depression, you know, and they're both fine for coming and they both make good candidates for therapy. You know, I don't turn one away because they may seem more stable than the other. I'm open and accepting to everyone where they're at in their particular journey. Um, you know, and the ones that who maybe aren't as stable, they, they, I don't see them as crazy or weak or I'm, I acknowledge and applaud them for coming into therapy. But I also, you know, congratulate and applaud people who come into therapy to maintain that behavior and to stay good. So, you know, that's a misconception. It, it definitely varies. And for no matter what reason you're coming in for, it doesn't make you weak or mentally ill or crazy. So with the normalization of mental health and therapy, I'm hoping this is something I see decrease over time. We're slowly but surely getting there, but it is a misconception to look out for both internally and externally. Um, the second is that psychotherapy is mostly just talk. This is one <laughs> that kind of sets me because a lot of work goes into therapy. It is not a passive interaction or engagement. Um, a lot of my clients know at least that the work doesn't end after the session. Once the 50 minutes are over and you leave the office or close the computer if you're telehealth, you know, it's just the beginning. Therapists are just planting seeds and opening some layers in those moments in the 50 minutes that we do have. And even though it may not seem like a lot is taking place, like, did I just vent for 50 minutes? Did I just, you know, I could have did this with a friend or family member, but no, behind the scenes, you know, the therapist is taking their notes, they're making connections, they're building patterns, they're comparing previous notes and looping in a common theme. They're bringing these things into awareness to you. So there's work on that end and also work within you. Me, I give a lot of homework and able to reinforce things we learned throughout session and incorporate it into your day-to-day -day life. Until you see me again the next week, um, you let me know what worked for you, what didn't. You know, if it didn't work, where was the resistance? What kept you from making that change? You know, so it's, it's more than just talking. And I did a presentation on radicalized therapies um, for pineapple last month or so. And it was just different things, you know, there's, there's dance therapy, there's art therapy. It's not always talking, but even if there is, know that transformative, transformative work is taking place, whether you see it, you know, or not, you know, everything's a gradual change. Um, number three is that psychotherapy can solve problems in one or two sessions. This is an unfair and unrealistic pressure to not only put on yourself, but for the therapist as well. Um, I'll get into structure within the next slide as far as um, therapy sessions go. But honestly, the first, second, and even maybe even the third or fourth sessions are dedicated towards building rapport, um, establishing that therapeutic alliance and relationship, making sure there's a connection. Um, you know, seeing if you're a good fit, identifying the, ther the, ther the therapist flow and then the therapist as well, trying to recognize yours and, you know, cultivate this into a rhythm that can be balanced and um, transformative for your sessions and beyond. So that's all in like the first five sessions of that. So, you know, it's not like in movies or in TV shows where, the therapist has this tremendous breakthrough in one sit down. You know, it isn't impossible, but it also is, is very rare. You know, it takes time to get there. Some people get there in five sessions. Some people it may take 10 or 20, you know, and not saying that to discourage you, but to more so give you a realistic time frame of 
what healing may look like for you. You know, everybody's journey is different. And the last thing you want to do is set some unrealistic timelines and diameters for yourself, um, especially for couples. A lot want to come in right before they get married or the big day. And it's like, oh, that is not a fair <laughs> pressure to put on me. You know, we'll take as much time as we need. And sometimes it's not um, as organized as we, we like it to be. It varies from person to person. Um, unless, you know, you're in a set up to where you have a set number of sessions like with pineapple support we get 16 so you know each session has to count and we're very intentional with where we're at and checking in and at the midway session we're you know checking in on our treatment goals and making sure those are getting hit so unless it's in a um, structured and predetermined number and setting like that then you know take your time with it if you have the availability and finances to just ride the wave as long as you can, then be sure to do so. But just know that it may not be one or two sessions. And the last one is my favorite and it's actually paired to this comic that we have here. Um, the one that says, therapist sit behind desk taking notes while you lie on a couch. And the comic says, actually I'm fine. I just like to have a place where I'm allowed on the couch with a little dog. Um, <laughs> this is my favorite on a many number, many number of reasons. Um, you know, this kind of dynamic with the couch and the notebook, this is kind of old school. This was classic old school therapy when, you know, we were kind of seen as authority figures and the posture just kind of represented that. Like we're kind of looking down, we've got our notebook, like we're observing you and judging you and writing all these awful things about you. Um, of course, I'm sure it was just to make the client comfortable, but naturally and humanistically, it reinforces already, you know, hidden, hidden belief that therapists are authority figures when we're actually not, you know, again, this um, presentation is about reminding you how you are the expert. So the first step in doing that is creating a setting and dynamic and um, atmosphere in which you feel like that. So um, I'll talk more about it in the next session, but this is, this is one of my favorites because this is the one I still get to this day. Um, you know, the whole notebook thing, I try not to, you know, unless it's a complex case where I'm really trying to keep up with things, but it's not necessarily necessary, you know, and, and you can make the request that the therapist not write things down if it's gonna make you feel inferior. So, yeah, those are the four most common misconceptions. Again, there's more, but hopefully if you're presented by any of these, whether it's within your own internal dialogue or, you know, with family or friends or in the media, whatever, you think of me and challenge that because if this is, if these are things that's keeping you from therapy, then you might want to reevaluate those reasonings, you know, there, I'm sure there's other valid reasons, but these are ones that you should at least challenge or question. Okay. So now that we've kind of touched on the misconceptions, I really wanted to talk about the reality of therapy sessions. And again, this varies from therapist to therapist, from, um, you know, different practices, different states. But for the most part, these three things should remain cost, constant across the board. Setting, which we kind of touched on in segue, it's a perfect introduction to this one. Structure, you know, I'll dive into what literally the structure of therapy should look like. And of course, what we're all here for, you're being the expert in that. So first is the setting, um, kind of like with the, with the, their therapist on the couch and the, and the client laying down, all of that is currently being transformed, radicalized um, in, in, a, in a many different ways. Before virtual, a lot of therapy um, establishments went from the white walls and the, you know, signing into the clipboard and taking a seat to very homey, cozy atmospheres. 
you know, now you walk into a therapy um, clinic or setting or, you know, mental health practice, and they probably have the low dim lights. They've got the couches, they've got the blankets, they've got, um, you know, the receptionist to greet you with a smile and, you know, checking you into the little tablet, you know, everything's very welcoming from the moment you walk into the door. Um, so this is just kind of, you know, letting you know the great lengths that a lot of therapists or practices are going to create that welcoming atmosphere for you. Um, my last establishment probably spent a whole lot of money to just take off the carpet floors, put in some wood, add some plants, like they literally had to revamp their office to look more like this. You know, we've got the colors, we've got the cozy floor and the couch, you know, if you do want to lay, you can, but that's your choice. We've got blankets. There's probably incense and essential oils in the air, you know, a lot of feel goods there. So everything's kind of tailored to already making you feel comfortable from the moment you walk into the door. So just wanted to recognize how intentional, you know, it is in transforming towards tailoring this for the client. Um, and setting also is now telehealth for a lot of people. Um, I have a few telehealth clients and I've heard that for some, having therapy in the comfort of their own home is everything, you know, but with that, be careful too. If we're going to do that, make sure you wasn't working from home all day and then just switching into therapy mode in the same location in the same computer. Make sure maybe you have some candles, some, you know, relaxing music playing in the background. Make sure you're getting comfy on your couch, you know, if you want to be in your pajamas, sure, you know, this is, this is what you make it. So I think breaking into the telehealth realm has really even um, expanded the setting piece even more and made therapy more realistic for a lot of people in that sense. Um, so that kind of is the reality now. I put this picture here just for reference because a lot of people haven't even seen a, a therapy room before. So if that's something that you kind of, if you're big on setting an atmosphere and the whole just walking through the process of walking up into the office and not knowing what to expect, hopefully that is kind of more reality affirming for you. And the second really important piece um, of understanding the reality of, reality of therapy is understanding the structure. Typically, like in every other relationship or, you know, dynamic, there's a beginning, a middle, and an end. So with therapy, the beginning, as I mentioned um, earlier, is just one to four or five sessions just dedicated to getting to know you and the therapeutic alliance and, you know, our flow, how we're going to, to mesh with one another. Um, the probably only hard part I will warn about that is that first initial assessment. That is a long, that some therapists do, not everyone, but we do at my practice, um, a long detailed, you know, psychosocial history of your past relationships and childhood and sexual history and substance use um, that we pretty much ask for out front so we could better help design your treatment plan. Um, so something to look out for, you know, not to scare you, but just so you're aware of it so that you're not surprised and you're not like, wait a minute, who is this person and why are they asking me for my life story and every little detail of it? Um, but that's the first session. But then second, third, fourth, fifth is, you know, typically more developing your treatment goals, getting to know the rhythm of treatment, understanding your therapist's approach and, okay, I showed up now, I'm thinking they're expecting this out of me, making that clear. You know, I start my sessions with agenda items and, you know, things you want to add on there, things that I have on there, how you want to adjust that to make it work for you. Um, you get introduced for a lot of flow and kind of logistics in that sense. Um, and then the middle is where the fun starts. Um, the middle is what I call um, creating everlasting change. This is probably session five to infinity or however long that you're with the therapist. Um, this middle stage should be collaborative. You should be as much as involved as the, in the stage as the therapist is. 
there should be no, you know, just giving you directions, directions and interventions. It should be, you know, asking, how do you feel about doing this? Um, what would happen if we, we took this approach this week? You know, very much inviting and having you part of the conversation for these sessions because this is where the bulk of the things happen. This is where the magic happens. This is where, you know, we process trauma. This is where we challenge thoughts and behaviors and replace them with something more healthy for you and your um, relationships. This is where, you know, if, if it's gonna get scary for you and difficult, this is probably where it'll happen. And, you know, again, not to discourage you, but at least so you know what to expect and okay, you know, of coming in with the awareness and education that gives you confidence and never has you feeling like you're losing control in any of this. Um, so again, middle, middle sessions can last from two months to two years. Um, I would be kind of intentional with your therapist if you're looking for long-term or short-term therapy, or again, if it's like a pineapple situation where you have a fixed number of sessions, just always be aware of that. And I know we can't always gauge it. Maybe we want to be for two months and it ends up being two years. Um, but at least you being in control and in the knowing of that can, again, give you the confidence and agency to make you the expert. Um, and then the last session is just really termination. Um, and it sounds like a scary word, but <laughs> um, maybe the, our transition, we'll, we'll say that. It's kind of when you're wrapping up things, I'm actually in a termination phase um, with my clients because I'm going out on maternity leave. And it's really just wrapping up everything that we've, we've discussed thus far, you know, kind of equipping them with the immediate tools that we've seen work for them and maybe that haven't worked, identifying the triggers and reminding them of what to do when they arise. Um, if they are wanting to be referred out to another therapist, making sure that um, you are taking care of and we take care of that order of business. Um, if it is someone within the agency that they're being transitioned to, you know, having that debrief with them so that you don't have to start over unless you necessarily have to. Um, so that's the sense when kind of the therapist makes that call, but you have the authority too to terminate. A famous question I get is, how do I know that I'm done with therapy? Or when, when do I know that it's time to break up with my therapist? Um, that's a really hard question. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's never a one answer I could give that'll fit for everyone. It depends case by case, but you know, if ever that question is even birth or presenting for you, bring it up to the therapist, get their idea of it too. You know, have again, a collaborative conversation of if this is in for you and if not, you know, where would you like to go? I get a lot of referrals from, you know, other therapists who are ending sessions with their clients because now sex is the common, you know, issue and they're having to be referred out to me. So sometimes just terminating to go to a different therapist that offers a different scope of practice for you is best. Um, but yeah, termination isn't always a bad thing. You know, I like pineapple because they call it graduation. And it's a celebration and it's a big deal to commit to 16 sessions. You know, a lot of people maybe only get through two. So that's pretty much the across the board structure. You know, there's a beginning, there's a middle and there's an end. Again, each phase might look different for different therapists, but at least you know that that's probably at least the ground where we're looking at to kind of get more reality behind what you're getting yourself into. Let me check time here. Okay. And lastly, what we're all here for is that you are the expert. My favorite analogy to look at this, um, the therapeutic relationship is seeing the therapist as um, the holder of a cookbook or um, are like this, this list of ingredients that you use to make a pie or a cake or something, whatever. I'm not a cook, so I'm, <laughs> it may not be the best analogy. Um, but you yourself, you're the ingredients. You're the flour, you're the sugar, you're the honey, you're all those things that you're bringing into the session. 
um, you know, the therapist could suggest to, okay, maybe that's too much sugar, maybe that's not enough, maybe more flour, maybe let it breathe, maybe preheat, maybe cool it off. You know, we could suggest those things, but you are the holder of the ingredients. You know your life better than anyone. You know, you, you have more power than you think in this type of dynamic. And the, the most successful, I mean, everybody's successful for just showing up to therapy, but the ones that I've seen that have progressed um, the most and have everlasting change are the ones that come to sessions prepared. They have their notebooks, they have their journal, you know, they did the homework, they make very vivid notes of what worked for them and what didn't. They are very vocal in expressing that to me so I can know, you know, to maybe tailor my approach. You know, it's not gonna hurt our feelings if something isn't working for you. It's not going to damage our, <laughs> you know, therapeutic ego if you tell us, you know what, I'm just not feeling that. You know, you are the expert, you hold the key you have the power. Um, the therapists are merely there to kind of be a passenger, you know, while you drive the vehicle and, and dictate where you would like to go. So, you know, don't ever feel intimidated by this dynamic. Don't ever feel like, you know, you could just sit there idly while somebody tells you what to do with your life. Because in reality, therapists don't give advice. They don't, you know, tell you what to do, it's ethically and legally, you know, we're not allowed to. Um, so with that, know that we could direct, we could guide, we could recommend, we could explore with you, but the decisions are all up to you. You know, we're never gonna push you further than you're willing or able to go. And, you know, a good therapist would be very aware of that, very aware. Um, so hopefully that kind of shapes more of a better reality for you. Um, again, things are so much different now from back when I was seeking services. Um, so do your research. I'm a big consultation advocate. If, you know, a therapist of interest is offering free consultations, schedule one. If they require a little fee um, to meet with them, schedule one. You know, if pineapple, you know, they have the whole therapy directory up, read the bios, do your research, um, because in doing so will give you the confidence you need to walk in the session, knowing that this person is going to be everything that you need for them in whatever um, mode that they're presenting. Um, and if I would have known all of this, you know, before that, the story I told you earlier of walking into my therapy sessions, I truly believe my whole treatment would have shifted, you know? So really take these into considerations and just know that you are the expert of all of this. You are in control. So we've um, debunked some myths. We looked at misconceptions. We've um, looked at the reality of therapy through setting structure and giving yourself agency and autonomy over your treatment. You did all the things, um, but it doesn't stop there. You know, even if you find a therapist and you're in treatment and you're taking charge, you know, of your treatment and everything, there still may be some signs of either having a good therapeutic alliance or a bad one. And I have to stop myself from saying a good or bad therapist because that may not be the truth. It may just be that person is not a good connection for you. Um, everything's connection and energy based, you know, not to get all woo woo, but you know, you meet a person in a room and you get that vibe like, okay, I'm, I, I, I can see myself, with, I can like, I like this person, I can see myself being friends with them or whatever. It doesn't change because of a person, you know, with the credentials and education to be a therapist that, that that um, ability to assess an intuition of knowing if someone's the right fit for you or not is still the same. So these are uh, signs of a good therapeutic alliance or not. Um, and again, whether it's the first session, whether it's the 50th, um, whether you're just now, you know, thinking about getting into therapy and this presentation is the first step with you, or if you're currently in therapy, and, you know, got kind of comfortable with the way that things are flowing with you and your therapist, it's always a good 
I dare to just stop and reflect on any green flags, green flags or red flags, because they could present at any time. And, you know, what do we do when they show themselves? So starting with green flags, you always want to feel respected and validated in sessions. Always. Um, we, you know, therapists are trained to provide that to you. And if that's not the case, whether it's on an intentional or unintentional level of the therapist, it needs to be, you know, addressed. And sometimes it's a cultural thing. Sometimes it's people's upbringings come through. Sometimes, you know, it's just not a good fit, you know, and it leaves you feeling disrespected and unvalidated. And that's never good. Um, but it is super great, good in a green flag if you do feel that way after a session. Oh, in session and beyond. Um, you feel that they are actively listening and paying attention. This seems like a no-brainer, but I actually have to go through great lengths to ensure that this, this piece is satisfied. Um, I set a timer so that I'm not, you know, just constantly checking the clock and I don't do so because I'm bored or not, you know, engaged with the person. It's just to make sure that we don't run out of time and I'm not, you know, drop something heavy when we have five minutes left, you know, but to them, it may translate as me being disinterested or preoccupied and very rude. Um, so little things like that should be, should be addressed, you know, setting timers, um, leaning in, you know, the little cues that make you feel like you're being heard are really good. And if those are being satisfied, super good green flag if you're actively being heard, seen, paid attention to. Um, another green flag is that they don't inappropriately share information about themselves or other clients. Um, believe it or not, and therapists get anxious too. We get nervous. Um, there are some clients that may bring us out of our comfort zone, and that may lead to some oversharing about themselves or other people it's a huge no-no and, you know, if it's not happening, great, it's a green flag, but if it is, just know that that's something to look out for and that, you know, therapists are human too. They may get uncomfortable and even though we're trained to not show it, sometimes it comes up in different ways, like oversharing or verbal diarrhea or whatever the case may be, so look out for that. And most importantly, you feel some kind of progress or change as sessions continue. And I love it and then say after the session, because a lot of people want this big, big bang coming to Jesus, everything's healed, you know, after each and every session, that's just not realistic. You know, some sessions may have a lot of breakthrough and insight. Some may be more on the chill side where we're just reflecting and reinforcing and, you know, it's not always gonna be just hyphen at every single session. But as long as you're able to maybe look back over the month, 30, 60, 90 days is my key and just feel like, okay, I went from three depressive episodes a week to just two. Or, oh, I was able to go into two um, social, socially anxiety inducing situations instead of just one. You know, that's progress. It's not gonna happen overnight. And more than often, it's a gradual change. So be monitoring that. Again, the therapist should be good at um, bringing this out to you, but for you to recognize it for yourself is twice as better. And then some red flags, uh, big, big red flags that you would think would be obvious and that you would think that if you got any sign of that you would terminate sessions immediately. But again, a lot of people get caught up in this, the therapist is the authority, they're the expert. So whatever they say or however they make me feel is part of the process. You know, of course, some uncomfortable feelings and really hard conversations might be showing up, but you should never feel insulted, hurt, or judged after a session. That is a huge red flag and probably you know, an obvious reason to terminate um, sessions with that person. And again, assaulted and just flat out being disrespected and, you know, maybe just having uncomfortable feelings about where a therapy session may have taken you 
because it's difficult are two separate things, but hopefully you're able to understand when it's just blatantly being disrespectful and you terminate with them. Um, another huge one is that you sense that they are unprepared for sessions. You know, another people assume that therapists all come prepared and they know what they're doing. And but you can tell when someone's not ready for something. If they're late, if you know it is virtual and they haven't seen the Zoom link until maybe just right before, you know, I, I do that sometimes when it's a busy day, but I really try to be prepared and give people enough notice to sign in and get comfortable and get ready. You know, those little things matter. Um, and I'm semi-structured in the sense that I do have an agenda list. I do have, you know, homework that I follow up on. Um, you know, but not every therapist does that. So if they don't, it doesn't necessarily mean they're unprepared. They may have a different approach, but you could kind of tell, hopefully, um, if someone's just BSing and if someone's just showing up and going with the flow, again, it shouldn't be passive, not for you and not for the therapist. Um, another huge red flag is if they are not adaptable to your particular needs and overall style. Like I said, I'm semi-structured. I come with the agenda. Um, but if my client says, you know what? I had a shitty week and I want to go, <laughs> I want to completely go somewhere else today. I have to be ready, willing, and able for that. You know, I can't be so stuck in my, my ways and my expectations for treatment that it, that it um, harms the client. So you have to be particular, you know, you have to be uh, adaptable in that. And you have to be mindful of their style. If they're not a homework person, if they, you know, consistently say, oh, I didn't do it. I'm not, I'm not assigning it anymore. You know, it's not my session, it's theirs. So if that's not what they're into, we're not going to do it, but we are going to find out something that may work for them. Like, are you better at recapping things? Are you better at just revisiting certain points of your week that may have caused you discomfort? Again, you are the expert. <laughs> you can dictate that. And it's our literal job and duty to be adaptable and accommodating to that. And last but not least, a huge red flag is if you don't feel in control of your sessions. Um, yeah, I, after a session, I, I request that the clients, you know, they're not jumping on to the next thing. They're not hopping on another Zoom call. They're not like, let's just sit for at least 30 to 20 minutes and process, you know, on your own journal, reflect. What just happened? How was that different from last month? Um, so that that's expected. But if you end this session as if you have no idea what just went on, things were over your head, um, the therapist was over talking you, you weren't validated, you weren't understood, you weren't seen, you weren't heard. Those are all a loss of control. You are no longer in the room. And that is a huge red flag. Um, and, you know, again, some people just kind of go with that. I have a person by you to vocalize that. Be expressive, you know. Maybe the therapist has is getting mixed non-verbal cues or signs that you're understanding when you're not. And a lot of clients actually also want to be the good client, you know, whatever, for whatever reason. It's rooted back to a lot of things, but... They don't want to make it seem like they don't understand. They don't want to present as a bad person. They withhold a lot of information and in, in wanting to not let the therapist down. No, all of that is loss of control. Um, you want to feel as in control as possible. And again, in order to um, promote that, come prepare. Know the flow and rhythm of the sessions and the person that you're working with. Um, understand that if you don't, if you didn't understand what just happened, if you feel judged, if you feel hurt, if you feel lost or confused, bring it into the room because now there's a loss of control there. And the last thing that you want to do is waste time, money, and energy on someone who's not, you know, giving you agency over your life. And a lot of times that is why people come in to seek help and guidance. Oh, yes. So hopefully um, that kind of 
gave you a sense of agency, autonomy, and power over your treatment. Um, knowing, knowing what to expect is huge. Again, I think with that bit of information from the very beginning, from my first hunts for the therapist, it would have changed the whole expectation, rhythm, and dynamic of the room. Um, knowing, you know, that we are in a very fun and transformative time where therapy can literally look like whatever you want it to, you know, and hopefully with that, it gives you motivation and um, power to make it your own. You know, if you want to be at home, if you want to be in nature, if you want to be in a clinical setting, whatever it is for you that makes you comfortable, let it be so. Um, and then hopefully, of course, you now with all this knowledge and expectation and awareness, you now feel like the expert because truly you are. Um, the, the therapist will be nothing without their clients. That's just what it is. So we, we are there for you. We are there to accommodate you. We are there to serve you. We are there to get you where you want to be. And, you know, not in a way that's submissive or authoritative. It's just literally meeting you where you're at and being collaborative in that. Um, so hopefully with all these things, it makes you feel more in control and charge of your treatment. Um, again, if that's not the case, whether it's from the first session or the 50th, know that it's never too late to say no thank you to that. And, you know, never get comfortable just because you've invested so much in some person when maybe there's a better fit out there that will take you even further, even further where you need to go towards meeting your treatment and your goals. Um, that's all I have. There was anything else from Pineapple? Let me know any questions, anything. If not, I'll wrap it up here. All right, it was a pleasure guys. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Always a pleasure to host for Pineapple Support and um, hopefully it was um, of great value to you. I will be doing some upcoming presentations as well. Just be sure to check out the website, Facebook, Instagram and all the fun stuff that Pineapple has in store for you guys. Until next time.